Esther chapter number 1. While you're going to Esther chapter 1, let me read you a letter that I wrote from someone else's perspective some years ago before I began to preach. Uh, Greetings, mere commoners assembled on such a day. It is doubtless your privilege to hear from me this morning. Please try to contain your thrill as my words come ringing into your unworthy ears. I was a man who had it all, wealth, power, prestige, and my choice of women to wed, and wed I did. As king, it was expected that I would have a queen, and no ordinary woman would do for such an extraordinary man as myself. And so it was that I married a dashing woman, well-favored and desired by all. Naturally, she could not comprehend how very lucky she was to have a man such as myself. What woman could? The mind of woman is such a small thing, after all. That is why they're to be dominated, ordered about, kept in their place. That is exactly what I did with my wife, my property. Until that day. Who would ever have dreamed such a thing could happen? Apparently, I had been far too good to her, because when I made one simple demand of her, she refused it. I was enraged, enraged, I tell you. How dare she not parade before my drunken friends and arouse their lust when I demanded it? Out of place. The woman was out of place, and I was just the man to put her back in that place. And I did. I made her pay for her insolence. I divorced her and banished her from being a queen. That, you common simpletons, that is how you handle a woman. Who am I? I'm the man who wrote the song, Breaking Up Isn't Hard to Do. (laughs) I am a Hasuerus. Let's read Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 22, please. Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even in 104 score days, And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white and green and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do every man according to their pleasure. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat at first in the kingdom, what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Mimucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands and their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. That Vashti come no more before king Ahasuerus 
Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which shall be, he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mamukin, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces, and to every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the reading of your word. The preaching to follow, Lord, I pray that you'd help these wonderful words to get down deep into our heart. I pray you'd help us understand them, dear God, and to realize the truth we can draw from them. Dear God, give me liberties I preach from them. Uh, may you set a guard upon my lips, Lord. Help me not to say anything you don't want me to say, but to have the liberty to say everything you do want me to say. May I follow you to the letter. And for everything you do, Lord, I give you the praise and glory. And these things we pray in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. We have before us the case of one King Ahasuerus and his wife, former wife, Vashti. He was the king of the Persian Empire, which at that time was the most powerful nation on earth, and that made him the most powerful man on earth. Most of the book of Esther is dedicated to the wife of his second marriage, Esther, and how she saved the Jewish people from an evil plot. But before there was a Queen Esther, there was a Queen Vashti. And as great as Esther was, Vashti was pretty great in her own right. This was a remarkable woman, a woman that any man would be lucky to be married to. She was beautiful and proper and strong and smart. But despite all that, this was a marriage that ended up broken. And I want to make one thing very clear right up front. It was his fault. But despite all that, this was, this was something that did not have to be. I've been amazed through the years, the people who made Vashti out to be the one at fault in this sordid affair. What's really amazed me is that most of the time, the people defending Ahasuerus and ripping into Vashti are women. In every case, it's been some woman who's been brainwashed into thinking that a husband is always right, even when he's wrong. Listen to me real carefully. Sometimes you're wrong. Just because you may be ahead of something does not mean you're always right. If you're one of those people that believe the husband is always right, you're going to be very unhappy with this message. So please just go ahead and get ready to be unhappy because that's just the way it is. Ahasuerus was an absolute jerk in all of this. And it wasn't Vashti that divorced him. It was Ahasuerus that divorced her. When a man's right and a woman is wrong, I'm going to say so. But when a woman's right and a man's wrong, I'm going to say so then too. And this guy was wrong because he had a huge multifaceted attitude problem. This guy destroyed a marriage with his attitude. That's not what we normally think, is it? When you think of a marriage being destroyed, you usually think of things like adultery or abuse, but an attitude can destroy a home just as quickly as either of those two things can, be it a bad attitude from a man or a woman. So let's look through this attitude problem that he had and find out what there is for us to learn and to apply to marriages today. First of all, notice he had an attitude of entitlement. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. The book of Esther begins by introducing us to a king, a man by the name of Ahasuerus. The name he's more commonly known by to historians is Xerxes. Please allow me to tell you just a little bit about him because once you know what kind of a man he was, the things you read about in the book of Esther begin to make more sense. Xerxes was a man who had both a soft side and a brutally hard side. On the soft side, he loved luxury. He loved living the good life, and he was a womanizer even though the laws of the Medes and the Persians forbid it. In other words, he felt like his position entitled him to whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it, even if it was something wrong. That's why you see him doing this just a few verses later. Look at verses 10 and 11. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded me human business the Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that serve in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with a crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. Now this thing that he was asking was expressly forbidden by all the laws and expectations of the Persian culture. His demand was that Vashti come and parade her beauty before all of those leering, drunken men. I have said, and I stand by my statement, that it was wrong in every way imaginable. Please allow me to tell you how it was wrong. It was, first of all, wrong morally. Now, this one really ought to be obvious. 
Matthew 5, 28, Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So it was wrong morally. Christ made that very clear. It was also wrong maritally to demand that a wife arouse the lust of men to whom she was not married and have that demand made by her own husband. According to Ephesians 5, a husband's to work to present his wife to himself, not to others. And ironically, in this instant, it was a man demanding immodesty of a woman, and we rightly castigate him. But in our very recent days, if a man even gently points out that the Bible expects modest apparel and modesty in women, he gets ripped to shreds by women. Listen to me real carefully. Both sides have responsibility in this. It's not a one or the other. Men have a responsibility not to lust. Women have a responsibility to be modest. It works together. We don't have a my way or no way uh, uh, approach in Scripture. We have a looking out for one another approach given to us in Scripture. We're to be thinking of the benefit of others. It was wrong also culturally. The custom of the Persians did not allow for women to appear in public like that. It was wrong due to the royal station as well. According to Persian customs, the queen, more than any other woman, was to be secluded from public gaze, so it was wrong in every way imaginable, and Ahasuerus knew it. Vashti knew it too, and she responded accordingly. Ahasuerus knew it, but didn't care. Why did he care? Because he had always gotten whatever he wanted it, whenever he wanted it, and he felt like he was entitled to it. If he wanted it, nobody dared tell him no. Men, you listen to me, that kind of a poison attitude will kill your marriage. That kind of an attitude is the exact opposite of what Christ commanded us to have. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but also every man on the things of others. This applies to the husband and wife relationship as well as to every other relationship. The text doesn't say let nothing be done through strife or vainglory unless it is how the husband treats his wife. It just says let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. This includes how the husband treats his wife Sir, before you do anything, you better consider how it affects your wife. Men, listen to me. It's not about you. As far as you're concerned, it better be about her. Sir, your wife's not your property. She's your mate. Your wife's not your servant. She's your best friend. She's not your old lady. She's your lover. She didn't come from under your foot. She came from your side. Sir, you ought to never be demanding, self-absorbed, and selfish. If you really want to have a great marriage, you'll stop behaving as if you're entitled to everything and start behaving as if your wife comes first in everything you ever do. Number two, he had an attitude of self-glorification. Look at verses 3 and 4. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even a hundred and four score days. It is almost impossible to overstate how arrogant this was. Ahasuerus threw a, threw a 187-day party for one purpose, and that was to have others pat him on the back and tell him how good he was for 187 days. There are male egos, and then there's stuff like this. Now, for starters, girls, would you listen to me for a second here? This kind of thing usually does not start after marriage. It's usually pretty evident before marriage. Now, why do girls not see it? They don't see it because they are Twitter-pated. Have you remember Bambi? Remember Twitter painted? They're, they're Twitter painted, so they don't, they don't normally see it. But you know who likely will see it? Probably your mom and dad are going to see it. Listen to me real carefully. If they come to you and tell you that Cletus McDreamy is an arrogant little punk, you probably better break up with him. But secondly, men, you who are married, some humility would do your marriage a lot of good. If you're more attracted to somebody else than you are your wife, it's going to cause a problem, especially if that someone is you. I told my wife that I'm going to start giving some marriage advice. I'm going to start telling people they need to break up with themselves. I honestly see some men that if they could do it over, all over again, they'd go back and take themselves to the prom. I'm just telling you, they've, they've, got, they've got a philosophy for life they live by. They've got, they've got a theme song they live by. I am so beautiful to me. Can't you see? I'm everything I hope for. I'm everything I need. I am so beautiful to me. 
Say, preacher, you're being silly. I see, I see it all the time. I'm just telling you there's men that have that attitude. Sir, it's not about you. You need to love your wife way more than you love yourself. He also had an attitude of thoughtlessness. Look at verses 10 through 11. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that serve in the presence of Hazarus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. Now there are several evidences of his thoughtlessness to be found in these verses. The first evidence of his thoughtlessness is that he let alcohol cross his lips. Listen to me, nothing good ever happens for a marriage by means of alcohol. No marriage is ever made better, stronger, financially more stable by alcohol. No relationships ever made more pleasant by alcohol. This is a bad thing rather than a good thing. The second evidence of his thoughtlessness is that he sent other men to order his wife around. Do you see this? You're laughing because some of you men know what it's going to be like if you try that. He sent other men to say, hey, your husband told me to tell you. How many of you husbands, that wouldn't go real well for you? How many of you wives would not really take too well if, that's, if something like that happened? I'm just telling you, I know better for my health and the health of others than to ever try something like that. I remember way back, back in the old building years ago, I don't know how many of you are old enough, you remember the Popeye cartoons? Do you remember Bluto? We had Bluto as part of our church years ago. I'm just telling you. He's about 400 pounds. He'd been in the Navy, scraggly beard, big, bold voice, the entire, the entire thing, just, just an abrasive kind of fella. He, he walks in, a, he storms, stomps, waddles, into my, into, my, into my wife's office one day, and he has a stack of papers in his hand like this. And he slams the papers down on her desk and says, make copies of those for me. She said, do it yourself. I said, yeah. Say, preacher, you encourage that? I sure do. I'm not going to let somebody else order her around, and I'm sure not going to be dumb enough to send somebody to order her around. She can stay awake longer than I can. <laughs> you say, but, but he was a king. But his most important position was that of a husband. Please tell me you know your Bible well enough to know there's no position on earth that a man can hold that's more important than that of a husband. A man has one flesh with his wife not his kingdom or his church or his job or his children. I don't care what position you hold, your most important role serves out of a husband. You better demonstrate thoughtfulness in that role. So he has an attitude of thoughtlessness. The third evidence of his thoughtlessness is that he asked her to do something that she was not going to be comfortable doing. Surely I don't even have to ask this. Is there really anybody who thinks their wife would feel comfortable getting immodest in front of their drunken buddies? Sir, a little thoughtfulness goes a long way in marriage. If you'll make a habit of thinking through how your words, your actions, and your requests are going to affect your wife before you say or request them, you may just save your marriage. He also, though, had an attitude of unmanaged anger. Look at verse 12. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Those words should paint a very clear picture of a man who has a bad temper and is regularly blowing his top. Can I tell you something? This was not an odd slip for a Ahasuerus. History records him as a man with anger issues. When his army is marching to war against Greece, Greece, they stop over at a house of his dearest friend and one of his best supporters, a man by the name of Pythias. Pythias and his wife have poured lots of money into Ahasuerus' kingdom and campaigns, and they have five sons. All of their sons are in his army as soldiers. They're getting older, so before they, the army marched away, they asked a request of their king, their friend. They said, sir, you're, you're going off to war. You're taking all five of our sons with you. We're getting very old and we're worried about what might happen if our sons don't come back. Could you leave us just one of our sons behind uh, in case anything goes wrong to take care of us in our old age? And Ahasuerus, very reasonable request, don't you think? Ahasuerus said, you want me to leave? You want me to leave one of your sons behind? Yeah, I'll be glad to leave one of your sons behind. That one right there. I'll leave that one right there behind. Cut him in half! Leave half his body over here. Leave half his body over there. March the army between them. That's Ahasuerus. Hasuerus has the engineers who built the bridge over the Hellespont killed because their bridge did not stand up in a hurricane. Hasuerus is in a storm out on the sea. The storm is sinking his boats. He is hanging over the edge of a boat with his leather belt, beating the ocean waves as if that's going to help anything. 
This man has anger issues. Is it any surprise that he blew his stack to his wife and destroyed his marriage? You ought to pay attention to what the Bible says about uncontrolled temper. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit. Be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. That's God's word. If you don't control your anger, you're a fool. Learn to control your anger. Proverbs 29, 22, An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. You say, but I can't control my temper. You can do whatever's important to you. People do whatever's important to them. Some years ago, a good friend of mine got diabetes, stopped eating sugar on the spot, never put another drop in his mouth. Why? Because it was important to him. A friend of ours was raising two kids of her own as, as a grandmother, still had a couple of kids at home, and then ended up having to take six more grandkids into the house to take care of them by herself. Why would you do that? Because you do what's important to you. If it's important to you, you'll learn to control that temper. You'll put that in Christ control as well as everything else. Sir, you get a grip on your temper, you'll lose your grip on your marriage. Then he also had an attitude of overreaction. Verse 13 to the end of the chapter is so funny that it's sad and so sad that it's funny. Look at verses 13 through 15, please. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. Now may I remind you please of the condition of these seven geniuses. All of them have spent 187 days at the drinking party. They reek of booze, their eyes are red, their speech is slurred, they are toasted. These are the men that the king turns to for guidance. It takes a very foolish man to turn to drunken buddies for guidance on his marriage or anything else for that matter. Think through who you ask your guidance of before you get that guidance. Well, Hasuerus turns to his drunken hired hands and asks what should be done, and predictably he got an answer that only brain-dead drunks could come up with. Verse, verse 16 through verse 19. And Mamukin, and by the way, this is neither here nor there, but does that not sound like something that happens when you get a cold? I guess horrible cold. I've got some mamukin in my chest here. I got to do something. Else. And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king of Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all the women, so that they shall despise their husbands and their eyes when it shall be reported. The king of Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the princes of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Now notice, please, something that Mamukin does as he begins to tell us what's happened to Vashti. There's a word he uses five times in three verses. Look at verse 16 through 18 again. Let's illustrate it as we go. Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath done wrong, not to the king only, but to, also to, what's the word? All, say it with me every time I say it, all the princes and to all the people that are in all the province of the king of Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so they shall despise their husband their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king of Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. May I paraphrase that, please? King, you got to do something. Every single woman... And the whole wide world's going to hear what Vashti did. And every one of those women in every country in the whole wide world is going to get all high and mighty and uppity against their husbands. Don't you think that's just a little bit melodramatic? It takes a drunken man to come up with something so over the top as this. And the truth is, if Ahasuerus had just let it go, it probably would, would have been forgotten. Everybody's drunk anyway. But he can't let it go. So he asks for advice. They come up with this advice because everybody in the world is going to hear about it. There's going to be trouble all over the world. So they come up with the idea that you need to divorce her. Why? Because of, according to verse 14, he's one of those princes against whom the wives were going to get all uppity. If, if Ahasuerus had not been drunk, he would be able to figure out that real quickly. This guy's only concerned about his problems, not the king's problems. Well, these princes led by Mamukin tell Ahasuerus he needs to divorce his wife Ashti. Here's what he said, verse 19. 
If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him. Let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. That Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus. Let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husband's honor, both to great and small. What he said and suggested can be summed up this way. I've got a great idea, king. Take your beautiful, spunky wife, wife and, and divorce her. And then make a law that she can never be queen again. Then tell everybody in the entire world about it. That way, even though you'll be single and have to find another wife somehow, our wives will treat us better. It takes a drunken fool to suggest something like that. It takes an even bigger drunken fool to go along with that overreaction. But alas, verse 21, and the saying pleased the king and the princes and the king did according to the word of Mamukin. Nobody there had enough sense to realize how brain dead they were all being. That they were, they were pleased by the idea. Tell me, man, you have a beautiful wife? How, how, would you, how, how could you be pleased about not having your beautiful wife anymore? Does that make any sense? Ahasuerus, five minutes earlier, five minutes earlier, my wife is the greatest thing in the world. She's so amazing, I want everybody to see what I've got. Now he's divorcing her. Really? How does that make any sense? Overreaction just a little bit? Verse 22, For he sent letters into all the king's provinces and to every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. As you read this verse, I'm pretty certain you, I, I know what you're thinking if you know your Bible. You're thinking, well, that actually sounds sort of biblical. You're partially correct. Keep a marker there. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Why are you going to Ephesians chapter 5? Let me read it again. For he sent letters in all the king's provinces and to every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Now look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Comparing those two passages sounds very much like the contents, basically the same in both, doesn't it? And if you think that, you're correct, it is. Both of them basically say the same thing, that the man's to be a rule in his own home, but the message in Esther is a flawed message. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You said they're both basically the same thing. They are. And the one in Ephesians is not, a, is not a flawed message. That's correct. But you know the same thing. The one in Esther is, is, is a flawed message. That's correct. How, how can it be the same thing and be a flawed message? Because there are two ways a message can be flawed. A message can be flawed in the content of the message or it can be flawed in the character of the messenger. In Ephesians 5, when God talks about man bearing rule in his own home, he says, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In other words, put them first in all things. Sacrifice for them. Elevate them to a position of prominence. You do everything to make their life outstandingly wonderful. You make your whole life about making their life wonderful. What do you see that resembles that in Esther chapter 1? It's not there. In Esther chapter 1, all you see is, Man! You better rule your own household. If Ahasuerus had loved his wife, this would never have been an issue because he wouldn't have asked her to do something so wrong to begin with. It was a flawed message because he was a flawed messenger. Sir, listen to me. If you love your wife like Christ loves the church, she really won't have any problem allowing you to head the home because it is a matter of allowing. God never said, Sir, make your wife submit. He directed it to the wives. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. All he told them, husbands, was to love your wives. Dane and I have been married for 27 years now. This will be 28. I got that right, didn't I? Good. Go, let's go check that. It's come March, be 28 years. I can count on no fingers the times I have tried to make her submit to me. I've never had to. I've spent my life in marriage just trying to love her and make all her days as wonderful as they can possibly be, and she has graciously allowed me to be the head of the home, and she's graciously submitted herself to me. I've blown it sometimes. I've done some things that she went, I told you, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but I've never had to make her submit. I've just loved her, and she submitted. Men, love your wives enough to be in the habit underreacting rather than overreacting. 
and of putting them first in all things. Ahasuerus destroys his home, but he doesn't do it in the usual ways. He doesn't, he doesn't go out and commit adultery and destroy his home. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't beat her and abuse her and destroy his home. He just gets an attitude problem. And the attitude problem destroys his home. I know a couple years ago, to say that the guy married up would be an understatement. He married a very pretty and sweet girl, and he was an unattractive human being. I don't know how he did it, but he did. But he got, he got very insecure over it, he got very, very insecure. I don't know why. Again, she agreed to marry him. But he decided he would, he would make sure she would never leave. He would beat her down to such a degree that she wouldn't have enough confidence to, leave, to, to ever leave. So he, he called her names all the time, fatty and stupid and all kinds of horrible things. Day after day, just beat her down, beat her down, beat her down, beat her down. And then a predictable thing happened. One day somebody showed up at work and saw her and said, you look really nice today. And that was about all it took. Not justifying the disillusion of a home. I'm saying that it was his attitude that destroyed it. But another guy, again, same situation, really not an attractive human being. I went to school with him years ago. He ended up marrying a girl, and when, when we realized who had married, I was like, he married her? How? Did she, like, go blind or something? I mean, as I, I, I don't get it. I mean, she was, like, she was like way, 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 way out of his league. But, but I was only kidding because I, I really knew why she married him. And here's why I say that. Dude was the nicest human being I've ever met. Made everybody feel absolutely wonderful all the time, constantly. If you got around him, he encouraged you. His leg could be ripped off. And he'd go, but that sure is a nice tie you got. Just the most encouraging human being. And some girl with good foresight and good understanding said, that's the kind of person I want to spend my life with. Sir, your attitude can either make or break your marriage. Ma'am, yours too. Your attitude can make or break your marriage. Why don't you do an attitude check?